By way of announcement, let me start by saying, because of a remission in the printing of the first hymn, you will need to find a hymn book which is founded in the pew rack in front of you. And please turn to hymn number 389, hymn, hymn number 389, O Jesus, I have promised. The grace of our Savior Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Though the storm clouds of doubt and fear threaten to overcome us, when the darkness of war and the deep pit of anger reach toward us, Lord of hope and life, be with us today.
God be with you. Let us pray. Grant us, O oh God, to trust in you with all our heart. For as you always resist the proud who confide in their own strength, so you never forsake those who make their boast in your mercy. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Good morning. It is great to be together in worship on this glorious, glorious day of God's creating. And I, I want to say something. If you were up early this morning, you heard the falling of the rain, which we really needed, and watered the earth before we could come into the sunlight of this day to worship. For those who are at home, we're glad that you're with us. Send us a note online so that we know your name and that you're with us today. And for those who are here, let's sign the pew pads found in the center aisle, pass them to the end so we get everybody's name. It's important to know that you're here. And any information we can share with you helps as well. Now, may the peace of our Lord be always with you. Let us pass the peace of Christ with one another. At this time, I'd like to invite the children to come forward, the youth. You're welcome to bring your adult with you, your parents, grandparents. I invite you to come join us on the steps for a message today with Miss Melissa. Good morning, and good morning to our friends at home. If you're at home, you can scooch closer to the TV. So, I wonder if anyone remembers, a couple weeks ago, we talked about a man named Moses. Does anybody remember? Reverend Joanna can fill us in. We read a story from Exodus, and in this story, we learned that Moses was tending his sheep out in the wilderness, and then all of a sudden, a voice spoke to him from a burning bush. And do you remember who that was? It was God. God, yeah. Yes. <laughs> and God told Moses he wanted him to lead the Israelites out of Egypt. We can only imagine how Moses was feeling, but what did God say? What did God promise? Do you remember, Miss Melissa? What did God promise? He told Moses to not be afraid and that he could do it. Yes. He believed in him. That's right. He said, I will be with you. So I brought something today that's like a continuation of our story. Can you all see that? And this picture is from one one of my very favorite artists, and I know Reverend Joanna loves him too. His name is John August Swanson. And he, his mother was Mexican and moved to California during the Mexican Revolution, and his father was Swedish. And his mother told him stories all while he was growing up. And so all of his artwork tells stories. And they're done in a style that is very much like Mexican folk art. It is Mexican folk art. Very bright colors and very engaging and lots, lots going on. So can you tell me, do you see something in here that you want to share? What this picture is? What do you see? So Reverend Tim said, parting the way. And that's what this picture depicts. Our gospel reading today. And that's Moses parting the Red Sea. Will you tell me a little bit about that? 
what happened here? Well, as we remember, uh, Moses was leading the people, the Israelites, um, out of Egypt to a safe place. And they got to the sea, the, the, this big sea, and you know, how are they going to get across? And all of a sudden, the waters parted, and Moses and the Israelites were able to cross to the other side. And those who had been following them were not able to make it. So Moses, led by the children, was able to lead his people into their, under their journey into their new land. And he did that because God told him, don't be afraid, I'm with you. And so he believed he could do it, and he did. So you know what? God is with you too, and you can do big things. So should we pray? I think we should. Dear God, Dear God, thank you for believing in us. Thank you for believing in us. And helping us to do the hard things. And helping us to do the hard things. And all God's children say amen. And all God's children say amen. amen. Now, if you want to come with me, we are going to read this awesome book called Old Turtle, Me and Miss Jenny, and I'm so excited. So, in classroom B. Or you can go back to your seat. A reading from the book of Exodus, chapter 14, one of the foundation stories of the ancient Israelites. The angel of God, who was going before the Israel army, moved and went behind them, and the pillar of cloud moved from in front of them and took its place behind them. It came between the army of Egypt and the army of Israel. And so the cloud was there with the darkness, and it lit up the night. One did not come near the other all night. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. The Lord drove the sea back by a strong east wind all night and turned the sea into dry land, and the waters were divided. The Israelites went into the sea on dry ground, the waters forming a wall for them on the right and on the left. The Egyptians pursued and went into the sea after them, all of Pharaoh's horses, chariots, and chariot drivers. At the morning watch, the Lord of the pillar of fire and cloud looked down upon the Egyptian army and threw the Egyptian army into panic. He clogged their chariot wheels so that they turned with difficulty. The Egyptians said, let us flee from the Israelites for the Lord is fighting for them against Egypt. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea so that the water may come back upon the Egyptians upon their chariots and chariot drivers. So Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and at dawn the sea returned to its normal depth. As the Egyptians fled before it, the Lord tossed the Egyptians into the sea. The waters returned and covered the chariots and the chariot drivers. The entire army of Pharaoh that had followed them into the sea, not one of them remained. But the Israelites walked on dry ground through the sea, the waters forming a wall for them on their right and on their left. Thus, the Lord saved Israel that day from the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Israel saw the great work that the Lord did against the Egyptians. So the people feared the Lord and believed in the Lord and in his servant, Moses. 
Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. A reading from the letter of Paul to the Romans, chapter 14. Welcome those who are weak in faith, but not for the purpose of quarreling over opinion. Some believe in eating anything, while the weak eat only vegetables. And those who eat must not despise those who abstain. And those who abstain must not pass judgment on those who eat, for God has welcomed them. Who are you to pass judgment on slaves of another? It is before their own master that they, that they stand or fall, and they will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make them stand. Some judge one day to be better than another, while others judge all days to be alike. Let all be fully convinced in their own minds. Those who observe the day, observe it for the Lord. Also those who eat, eat for the Lord, since they give thanks to God, while those who abstain, abstain for the Lord and give thanks to God. For we do not live for ourselves, and we do not die to ourselves. If we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. Whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end Christ died and lived again, so that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. Why do you pass judgment on your brother or sister, or you? Why do you despise your brother or sister? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, As I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall praise, shall give praise to God. So then, each one of us will be held accountable to God. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church.
Our gospel lesson this morning comes from the 18th chapter of Matthew, beginning in the 21st verse. Listen for the word of God. Then Peter came and said to him, Lord, if another member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, not seven times, but I tell you, 77 times. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he began the reckoning, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. And as he could not pay, his Lord ordered him to be sold together with his wife and children and all his possessions and payments to be made. So the slave fell on his knees before him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the Lord of that slave released him and forgave him the debt. But that same slave, as he went out, came upon one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii, and he seized him by the throat. He said, Pay what you owe. Then his fellow slave fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me and I will pay you. But he refused. And then he went and he threw him into prison until he would pay the debt. When his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed. And they went and reported to their Lord all that had taken place. Then his Lord summoned him and said to him, you wicked slave. I forgave you all the debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not also have had mercy on your fellow slave as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his Lord handed him over to be tortured until he would pay his entire debt. So our heavenly Father, so my heavenly Father will also do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother or sister from your heart. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks be to God. Some of you may know that I picked my college, McAllister College, because I didn't have to take math as a requirement to graduate. Yeah, I know, it's really sad, isn't it? <laughs> For those who are really good at numbers, you may be really upset and distressed by that. But for the rest of you, please have mercy on me. <laughs> uh, as a sign of my inability to do numbers well, the sermon title is wrong. It should say, forgive 77 times or 490 times, which is what Luke and Matthew talk about, seven times 70, not seven times 77. So anyway, whatever works best for you, let's, let's go there. I want to also share a reading that is a part of the lectionary texts, uh, but we did not read this morning, and it comes from Sirach. Uh, in the Apocrypha, uh, you will find these texts. In other traditions this morning, this will be read in church. So let me share this reading from the book of Sirach. Sirach is a book of wisdom uh, that comes from the Hebrew ethical teachings, and it was written around 200 BCE by a Jewish scribe named Ben Sirah of Jerusalem. So listen for this reading that comes from Sirach 2730 through 287. Anger and wrath, these are also abominations and the sinful man will possess them. He that takes vengeance will suffer vengeance from the Lord and he will firmly establish his sins. Forgive your neighbor the wrong he has done, and then your sins will be pardoned when you pray. Does a man harbor anger against another and yet seek for healing from the Lord? Does he have no mercy toward a man like himself and yet pray for his own sins? If he himself being flesh maintains wrath, who will make expiation for his sins? Remember, the end of your life and cease from all these troubles. Remember destruction and death and be true to the commandments. Remember the commandments and do not be angry with your neighbor 
remember the covenant with the Most High and overlook ignorance. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each one of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our salvation. Amen. A wise Catholic sister named Sister Margaret once said, be careful about over-tending your wounds. Some people go through life pressing a bruise so that neither they nor they hope the world will ever forget it and they will always see the bruise. It's quite an image to have, really. I can see myself at times focusing on a purple mark on my arm, remembering exactly who had bumped up against me and my schemes and thrown my perfect plan off track. Has this ever happened to you? Have you done something similar to this, nursed a wound that you can see and feel and touch? Sister Margaret's advice was a gentler version of Sirach's opening observation. Wrath and anger are hateful things, yet the sinner holds them tight. What motivates us to cherish wrath and anger? Sirach doesn't say, but he suggests that a remedy for it is to remember our last days and set enmity aside. Another rabbi wrote years later, begin each day forgiving those toward whom you feel wrath and anger as if it was your last day. When he told this to his students, the students turned to their rabbi and said, why? Why would we treat this day as if it were our last day? And their teacher answered, we need to live each day as if it were our last day, because it may be. So lay it aside to begin each day. Maybe that's where Jesus was going with his 77 and 490, where the wisdom of Sirach gives us clear maxim. Jesus tells us a story to confound us from multiple angles. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> you do this a lot. When Jesus talks about a king and two servants, the story sounds pretty straightforward. One person forgave, another didn't, so the stingy guy loses out in the end. Anyone from about five years old can get this, right? But it is a lot deeper, so let's dig a little deeper. First of all, we have the king. Playing the role of God in this production, the king, of course, is omnipotent. He can buy and sell both people and things at will. He calls on one of his slaves. That's the literal translation comes out to, to settle accounts, to settle accounts. Now the slave is in big trouble. He owes the king something on the order of 6,000 to 10,000 working days and working days wages. That's about 20 years of work or well over a million dollars in today's terms. Nobody but another king could come through with such a repayment. When the slave begs, the king spares him and his family from being killed and banished from obs into obscurity. So what did the king accomplish in this? He demonstrates and acts with full extent of his power and authority. He has the power to erase debt, even greater than being able to collect on it in some ways. As we know from the reaction of the servants, the public saw what he did. What the slaves perceived was obvious. They saw the king change his whole heart, his whole way. But what about the guy for whom the king changed? We might say that he pleaded with the king and got, got what he asked for, right? Did he think he had pulled one over on the king? That his act was so good that the king fell for it? Did he feel ashamed that he had stooped to begging? Did he feel like he had gotten let go? He had, he had gotten let, let off? Did he just think the king was stupid? All those attitudes are possible all at the same time. Even if the slave had conned the king, the entire situation made the vast difference of their power immensely and painfully obvious. As slave, whether 
debtor or released, he would always see himself as beholden to the king, as would others. In the very next act, the tables turn. The absolved debtor has the upper hand over someone else who owes him. And what does he do? Having learned nothing about real power, he exposes the tininess of his mind and heart by sending this fellow to debtor's prison until the debt is paid. Again, a highly unlikely outcome. When other people see how the tables are turned, they go and tell the king. In the end, the original debtor ends up in a torturous condition that he brought upon himself. When we go beneath the surface of this story, we see that even after being relieved of his debt, the first slave chose to live in a world of oppression and domination. Although the king's forgiveness had created an alternative to strict economic justice or tit-for-tat relationships, the slave rejected that option. Given the opportunity to increase the bounty, the bounty in this world, he instead supported a caste system that offered him petty superiority by reinforcing a strictly transactional system and the power of dominion he ultimately became his own torturer as sirach warned he held tight to terrible things and he created more terrible things there would always be someone over him and there would always be someone that he could torment Sirach talked about the cherishing of wrath. That seems to be the direct route to self-inflicted torment, the cherishing of wrath. Is there another way to go? How about the alternative to cherishing wrath, cherishing gratitude? Instead of pressing the bruise continuously, we could rejoice and marvel at our body's remarkable powers of regeneration and healing. Before we call in any debts, we might take account of what has been given to us, beginning with life itself, and then all the unmerited advantages in our time and place in history we have received through generosity. I can think of at least 490 reasons to forgive. And then when I started writing them down, I thought, no, no one's going to stay for a 490-point sermon. Am I right? Good. OK, I just want to make sure, because I've got them in my hip pocket if you want me to pull all 490 out. I can think of those reasons, but I want to be practical today. I want you to think about forgiveness in your own self-interest. I want you to think about forgiveness in your own self-interest. Forgiveness helps you heal. In a study on unforgiveness, John Hopkins Medicine revealed that there are significant impacts on the body, both physically and mentally, when a person refuses to forgive. According to the study, unresolved conflicts can lead to chronic anger, which puts the body into a fight or flight mode, resulting in changes of heart, changes of heart rate and blood pressure and immune responses. And these changes increase the risk of depression and heart disease and diabetes, just to name a few conditions. Research has also shown that unforgiveness is connected to the weakening of the immune system, reducing of sleep, chronic pain, and cardiovascular problems. Because unforgiveness hinders the body's ability to heal Forgiveness exercises the opposite. It exercises the, the body's ability to take the world on in a new way. There are now whole trainings on forgiveness for cancer patients because they have found through the study and through the research at John Hopkins and other places that cancer holds on to us, right? But if we let go of the things that we're holding on to, we change. Very powerful. It's important to note that forgiveness can have huge health benefits. So this is where the self-interest comes in. The act of forgiveness lowers the risk of heart attack, improves cholesterol, increases sleep, reduces pain, blood pressure, and levels of anxiety, depression, and stress change. So if you're struggling with forgiveness, 
it's important to remember that it's in an active process that you're in courts a decision to hurt you. It's actually hurting you personally and physically and spiritually. And that's where Jesus is teaching on forgiving 77 times or 490 times comes in. I like the choice. Jesus gives us a choice. You can do it 77 times or you can do it 490. Most of us would choose, of course, 490 because we want to forgive more <laughs> rather than less. Dr. Karen Schwartz from John Hopkins writes that we have to make forgiveness a part of our daily lives on a daily basis, working on forgiveness over and over again. She says, forgiveness is a choice. You are choosing to offer compassion and empathy to a person who has wronged you. The following steps can help you develop a more forgiving attitude and benefit from better emotional and physical health. She offers these. First, reflect and remember. That includes the events themselves and how you reacted, how you felt, and how the anger and hurt has affected you since. Second, empathize with the other person. For instance, if your spouse grew up in an alcoholic family, then anger when you have too many glasses of wine might be more understandable, right? Third, forgive deeply. Simply forgiving someone because you think you have no other alternative or because you think your religion requires it, read Christianity, it may not be enough to get you to healing. One study found that people whose forgiveness came in part from understanding that no one is perfect were able to resume normal relationships with the other person even if the other person never apologized. Those who only forgave in an effort to salvage the relationship wound up in a worse relationship. Very important to remember that. Fourth, let go of expectations. An apology may not change your relationship with the other person or elicit an apology from her or him. If you don't expect either, you won't be disappointed. Fifth, decide to forgive. Once you make that choice, seal it with an action. If you don't feel you can talk to the person who wronged you, write it down. Write down your forgiveness in a journal or even talk about it with someone else in your life whom you trust. Sixth, forgive yourself. And this one is the big one. The act of forgiving includes forgiving yourself. For instance, if your spouse had an affair, recognize that the affair is not a reflection of your self-worth. Literally, at the heart of all that is essential in the work of forgiveness, forgiving oneself is there at the core of it. Forgiving oneself can be a challenging, challenging process, but it is essential for mental health and well-being. And here are five steps. See, I have five more things and I'm done. I'll sit down. Understand your emotions. Becoming aware of the emotions you're experiencing is an important part about learning how to forgive yourself. Research has found that identifying and labeling your emotion can help you reduce the intensity of your feeling. Second, accept responsibility for what happened. Forgiving yourself is more than just putting the past behind you and moving on. It is about accepting what has happened and showing compassion to yourself, facing what you have done or what has happened in the first step towards self-forgiveness. Third, treat yourself with kindness and compassion. Forgiving yourself requires confronting your actions and showing remorse for what happened. But it is important to approach this with self-compassion. Fourth, express remorse for your mistakes. Expressing remorse for your mistakes can help you move forward and let go of negative feelings. And finally, make amends and apologize, including apologizing to yourself. Making amends and apologizing can help you take responsibility for your actions and show that you're moving on. You and I don't need to keep pressing the bruises anymore. And we certainly don't need to end up in prison, a prison of our own creating. In fact, according to Matthew 18, 21 to 35, it is by not forgiving that we always end up in a place like that. No matter how you get there, 
Let's all step into this, forgiving 77 times or 490 times if you prefer. 77 days or 490 days. 77 months or 490 months. 77 years or 490 years. I don't think any of us will make that last number. <laughs> Whatever works best for you. But make the choice and start today to forgive others and forgive yourself. It will be good for you, for your health, your happiness, and good for those whom you love and those around you. Amen. Let us continue in a prayerful spirit. O oh, gracious and forgiving God, we thank you for your active and felt presence in our midst at this very moment as we reflect on your word for us this day. O oh, God, we all have life experience of both seeking forgiveness and offering forgiveness, and yet it is so hard. And so on this day, we pray that you would touch our hearts and stir our spirits, that we would choose forgiveness over bitterness and seek reconciliation where there is hurt and brokenness within our relationships and within our lives. O oh, merciful God, our hearts are breaking as we try to process the news of the catastrophic flooding in Libya this past week, as the death toll continues to rise and is now well over 11,300 lives that have been lost. O oh God, inspire us as a nation and as a community to respond with compassion, and generous support of relief and recovery efforts. O oh God of peace and unity, we also pray for safe neighborhoods and communities here within Central Ohio and across our nation where gun shootings have become everyday news. Inspire us, O oh God, and Give us all the political will and courage to finally bring about meaningful gun reform. O oh God of compassion, God of community, we also lift up our family members and friends and members of our congregation who are in need of hope and healing and prayers including those who remain on our prayer list, as well as those who have been recently added, including Jane, Bill, and Lynn. We also lift up family members and friends of our congregation, including Martha's cousin, Martha, Reverend Dale, Melody's niece and husband, Kathy and Mick, Amy's father, Michael, and Mary's friend, Tim, as well as those who are listed in our family and friends section of our prayer concerns. And oh God, we also lift up all of those who are mourning in our community, including Jackie Dean, and her family on the loss of her niece, Henrietta. We lift up Tim's friend, Richard Murch, and his family on the death of his stepdaughter, Beth Little. We hold in our hearts Sarah Giffen on the recent loss of her sister-in-law, Lois. And we continue to hold Victor John and his parents and his extended family in our hearts and prayers at this time as they grieve the tragic loss 
of Victor's nephew, Matthias. And we also lift up Melva on the recent loss of her friend, Steve, and we continue to grieve with Jenkins Smith family and his friends on his recent death. Oh dear God, we lift up all of the prayers that have been named as well as those that remain in the silence of our hearts. We know that you hear each prayer and you respond to each prayer in your own way and in your own timing. And so we lift them all to you in the name of your precious begotten, our sovereign and our savior who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. At this time, I'd like to invite Teresa and Brendan to come forward from the Pathway Clubhouse, who will offer our mission invitation this day. Hello. Um, I am Brendan. I am Brendan Pratt. I am a client of the Pathway Clubhouse. Standing beside me here is our program manager, Teresa Conley. Uh, Pathway is a accredited clubhouse, what's known as the Clubhouse Model. We're a mental health program. We include elements of a vocational program, uh, partially a, a stigma-free place for people with mental illness to go. We uh, have a hybrid administration model. Uh, we're about half client run and half staff run. So there's oppor big opportunity to be involved in running the, the program and the organization. Um, uh, if you want to know more about the Clubhouse model, I would advise you to check out Clubhouse International's website. I don't have the URL off the top of my head, but you can probably find it with Google. I also want to point out that uh, we are the only one of our type in Franklin County, and we only became such in part because of a grant from the Bread Organization, which our esteemed Reverend Aaron is an active member of. Um, now, we do have a parent agency. They cover the basics. They keep the lights on, they keep the staff paid, but anything beyond that we have to fundraise for. That can include act for activities, trips, computers, and other equipment from time to time things of this nature. Um, so anything you give would be appreciated. Uh, I wasn't going to make this personal, but everybody keeps telling me I should add personal anecdotes. So OK. <laughs> um, no, seriously, I've been a client there since I think 2004. And I got my job at the Awesome Company, which is an, a t-shirt printing shop in Grove City, which is autism centric, That's in, which is also a good thing to look at but it's that's another story but uh, so um, please give what you can thank you oh we'll float around if there's any questions we'll float around a little bit afterwards thank you
gifts given and received, O oh God, we offer our thanks and thanksgiving. May we share our abundance with all who have need, and may we share our hope in like measure. Amen. In preparing to depart, we as a faith community have heard the word and are called to respond and serve. Reverend Tim has a few announcements. I want to invite everyone today at 4 p.m. to return for the Evensong service, the first of 2023-24, and it will be glorious as you've received a gift this morning. The gift will multiply, so I hope that you can come. Also, I want you to be aware that the announcement is now out officially and formally that three weeks from today, we will have a meeting, special congregational meeting, uh, to look at constitutional changes. They've come to you in a lot of different forms, including you'll find um, them printed up at the doors as you're exiting today, so please take them with you. Um, I think that going through them will help as we come to that time of meeting. And finally, um, I'm gonna invite the bread team following as the hymn is finishing to come forward. All of those commissioned today for the ministry of bread, please come forward. And I invite everyone who would like to join our um, house meeting in the parlor at 12.30 today. Kay Martin and I, Dr. Martin and I will be co-leading that, so you're welcome to join us in the parlor. Thank you. And now Susie Loik from Church Vitality has an announcement. I've been told that I don't project well, so if you can't hear me, please raise your hand. Okay. Um, the Vitality Commission is reviving Legacy Sunday with an old-fashioned picnic next Sunday after the 11 o'clock service on the West Lawn. We will celebrate our 171 years as a church formed by 42 abolitionists. They believed Christianity was more than attending church. Being a Christian meant living as the Bible teaches and as Jesus showed us. This is your personal invitation. So if you haven't received one, um, see one of the deacons or me after the service. And then we ask that you complete it today with your name and the number of those who will be attending. Um, put, place it in the picnic basket at each one of the exits or at coffee hour after the service. Uh, my Vitality Commission is mindful of cost containment and food waste. And that's one of the reasons we're asking for you to RSVP. Please bring your dish to share to the kitchen prior to the picnic. We'll have food tables set up in the hallway of the education wing. And in keeping with our commitment to honor Mother Earth, the church will provide water, washable utensils and cups, and compostable plates. As of Friday, we have 76 people attending, and we hope you'll add to this number. Remember, Everyone is welcome, members, guests, and visitors. Thank you. Be sure to, to read your Connections e-newsletter and depart to serve leaflet for information about this afternoon's Evensong performance and upcoming Bread House meeting. Please like and follow us on the First Church Facebook page and the church's YouTube channel. Now let us depart with a heart to serve. Thanks, Thanks be to be God. God.
It takes a lot of courage to come to church when you're grieving. So for all of you who have come today, yeah, where's the bread team? I clearly asked for you to come forward. Oh my gosh, it's like herding cats. Come on up. Didn't I say come forward on the hymn? Oh my heavens, okay. I'm gonna give the benediction, then the blessing, then we'll sit down. Everybody get up here while I do the benediction. <laughs> don't face them, don't face me. <laughs> you guys are too much, okay. This is our bread team. <laughs> So, um, yeah, let me do the commission, then I'll do the benediction. All right, let's all hold hands. <laughs> Dear, let us pray. Gracious God, we do ask you to bless and keep the folks of bread, each one of us a member of bread. We ask that you give guidance and strength and leadership to the bread leadership team. For all who are here, for those who are not able to be with us, let us be the presence of your light and your life for justice in this church and our community. And let us all join together in this noble and important work of making justice come to all. We pray this in Christ's name, amen. Now stay here. It took me a while to get you here, so back to what I was saying. Each one of us comes to church with something we're carrying. And I'm aware today as I have embraced and welcomed and look out upon you that a number of us are carrying deep grief today um, for all sorts of reasons. You're very courageous to come when you're hurt. You're courageous to come when you feel disconnected. You're courageous to come when you feel apart and alone. And I'm grateful to God that you're so courageous. May God continue to shine his light on you. May the light shine in you and through you to others. And may you always know his peace, now and always. Amen.